Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing, we were discussing about the, uh, the generation of uh, recombinant DNA or rec generation of genetically modified organisms and in this particular kind of discussions what, what we have discussed so far, we have discussed about the host as well as the transforming agents. So, in detail we have discussed how to produce a genetically modified organisms and subsequently we have also discussed the strategies how to produce the protein uh, intracellular as well as extracellular in different host strains whether it is bacteria, yeast, uh, insect cell lines or the mammalian cell line. Now today what we are going to discuss, we are going to discuss about the extraction of this particular product from the overexpressed cells. So, as you know that the, uh, uh, the complete process of the product development within uh, the biotechnology is uh, considered to be into two phases and what are these phases? So, we have two different types of processes to get the final product these are called upstream processes or the downstream processes. Whatever we have discussed so far which is like uh, getting the gene from the host strain, then cutting the gene and uh, generating the sticky ends. Similarly, you are processing the transforming agents and getting the cut plasmid and then you are putting the gene as well as the cut plasmid to generate the recombinant clone. Then we are putting this recombinant clone into the bacteria and generating a genetically modified organisms. Then we were screening these organisms to know the screen the desired uh, organisms with the desired features. And all these processes what we have discussed so far are considered to be upstream processes which are being involved. Now once you have generated the product then it comes into the downstream processing. Within the downstream processing, uh, you can have the two possibilities either the product what you are generating is a extracellular product or it is a intracellular product. For extracellular product, that product can directly be taken into the downstream processing and whereas for the intracellular products, the first step would be to disrupt the cells and extract the product into the supernatant. Once you got the crude product which is either from the extracellular product or to the intracellular product, then it will be go through with the different uh, types of purification stages where either you do the solid liquid extractions, then you will do the concentration and then you will do the purifications using the chromatography techniques and then finally you are going to get the purified product. So, in this whole step of downstream processing, if the product is intracellular, the first step is that you have to do the cell disruption and that is what we are going to discuss today. What we are going to discuss is what are the methods you can use for this cell disruption so that you can get your product into the liquid phase so that you can use them for the downstream processing events or the downstream processing and then finally you will can get the final product. If you remember uh, when we were discussing about the different types of host cells, uh, we have said that you can use either the prokaryotic host cells such as the bacteria or you can use the eukaryotic host cells such as the animal or the plant origin and you can use the single cell eukaryotic host which is the yeast. So, you have the different choices of host cells and accordingly you can use the transforming agent as well. So, 
all these host strains if they are containing your product which is inside the cell has to be taken out and what you see is that when you see the host cells, the host cells are varying in terms of their physical strength which means the, the cell is going to have the different variable level of uh, physical uh, strength to be broken down. Then you have the varying chemical composition of these host cells. So, that also can be taken care into the disruption processes and then at the end the structural organization is also different between the all these four different strains. For example, in the case of prokaryotes there is no organelle presence. So, once you broken the cell wall and once you broken the bacterial cell uh, the product will come out. Whereas, in the case of yeast animal or the plant they all are going to contain the organelles. So, even if you have broken the outer plasma membrane that will not ensure that the product will be released into the supernatant. You may have to broken down to the particular type of organelles and then you can get the product into the very very high concentration into the supernatant. So, depending on the type of host strain you also have to devise the strategies to disrupt the cell wall or disrupt the cells. Depending on the, uh, the different types of properties in which the host cells are varying from one to each other, the disruption methods are also being developed accordingly. So, you have the physical method, physical methods are the method where you are using the physical properties or physical parameters such as pressure, temperature and all other kind of parameters. So, that that will actually going to affect the cellular integrity of the host and then that will eventually going to lyse the cells. Similarly, you can use the chemical or the enzymatic method. So, since the host strains are varying from one to other simply by having the different types of chemical compositions, you can use the chemical as well as the enzymatic method to disrupt the different types of host cells. And then lastly, you have the mechanical method. So, mechanical methods are mostly being developed to break the very, very difficult cells to uh, broken down. Mostly the me mechanical methods are developing the shear stress within the cell or uh, within the liquid and that shear stress is disrupting the cells. So, let us discuss and start our discussion about the different types of cell disruption method with the physical method and as I said the physical method are going to exploit the different physical properties to disrupt the cells. The idea of physical method is that when you apply a physical force that actually is going to give the stress to the cell and in that response the cell will either going to shrink or either going to expand. In both of these process, in these uh, both of these events, the cell is eventually going to burst and that is how it is going to release the cellular content into the supernatant. The first method what we are going to discuss is thermolysis. As the name suggests, the thermolysis means that you are going to give the thermal stress which means you are going to vary the temperature of that particular cell in a very, very short span of time and that process is known as the heat shock. So, this method is very easy, economical and require no additional specialized equipments which means you can simply do a thermolysis by having a incubators or having a water bath which can actually give you that particular type of precise temperature. Uh, the only way when you can use the thermolysis is when your product is thermostable which means if you vary the temperature it should not destroy or it should not degrade your products. This method gives a heat shock to kill the organism and as a result it disturbs the cellular integrity without affecting the product. The effect of heat shock depends on the ionic strength, presence of chelating agents such as EDTA and presence of other proteolytic enzymes. So, you can imagine that if you give a heat shock, so you might have uh, seen that when we were discussing about the bacterial cell, if you give 
the very very uh, brief period of heat shock what will happen is the cell is going to expand okay and in that process when the cell will going to expand this since this process is going to be happen so fast that the cell is going to utilize the whatever the lipids it has uh, and for a smaller circle so when it expanding from that particular volume to a larger volume in a very very short span of time it does not get that time to synthesize the additional lipids which is required as per the surface area of the larger surface larger volume or larger ball in that case what happen is it actually expands and it actually get burst instead because the, the cell has a capacity until it can expand and keep using the similar kind of keep using the uh, uh, the same lipids what it was using for the smaller volumes but beyond that it may get just burst and that actually will allow the cellular content to come out and that is exactly what happens if you do a, th a thermolysis the cell will expand and eventually it will cannot sustain that particular volume and that will burst let me give you an example example or daily life example if you take a balloon okay and suppose you imagine that the balloon is a is a cell okay now what you do is take this balloon and put it into a warm water or if you just dip this balloon into a hot water bath what will happen once you put the balloon into the water bath the balloon will have a elastic elastic uh, rubber okay so balloon will expand to a certain extent but beyond the, the elasticity of the rubber uh, the balloon because the air which is present inside the balloon is giving the pressure on to the uh, outer layer and as a result the outer layer is expanding but it cannot expand beyond a limit and ultimately what will happen is the balloon will burst exactly the same thing happens when you put the cell into the thermolysis you change the temperature as you change the temperature the cellular content which is present inside mostly the water is going to expand or going to acquire larger volume and as a result what happen is it uh, it actually asks the cell to expand as well but the cell cannot expand beyond a limit and ultimately the cell is going to burst and it will going to release the cellular content but as i said the thermolysis method can be used only if you are sure that the product what you are generating or whatever you are producing inside these cells are thermostable now the next method is called osmotic shock most of the mammalian cells have a plasma membrane with active transporter to maintain the osmotic balance maintaining an osmotic balance is an active process with expenditure of energy okay so prolonged exposure to the cell with a hypotonic liquid such as water causes osmotic imbalance and ultimately causes lysis of the cell so what happen is if you have a cell and this is this osmotic shock uh, uh, is only true for the cell which contains the plasma membrane for example if you take a bacteria and put it into the water or hypotonic solutions it is not going to be experiencing the osmotic shock because the bacteria or the plant cell is going to have the very thick cell wall and that thick cell wall is going to make the things impermeable and as a result it is not going to experience any change in concentration of the solutes from inside to outside and that's why it will not experience any kind of osmotic imbalance but in the case of mammalian cells which do not contain the cell wall except the fungi or the yeast uh, they will experience a osmotic imbalance and as a result if you are putting a cell into the hypotonic solutions the concentration gradient would be in such a way that it is it is going to take up the water from inside to outside but if you put the cell in a hypotonic solution and water will be coming inside the water pumps which are going to be operating on to this cell will be keep exporting this water outside until the cell is going to be exhausted with the energy once the cell is getting exhausted with the energy there will be no export of water 
from the cell and as a result the cell will start acquiring the water from the outside because the outside uh, environment is hypotonic which means the concentration of solute is less. So, the water will come inside and it will be keep coming until the cell can sustain that particular type of expansion, but beyond that it is going to do the exactly the same what we have discussed just now about the thermolysis. It will going to burst the cells because the cell cannot sustain that much expansion and as a result the cell will not be able to hold the cellular content and the cellular content will be released into the external media or it will get going to be burst. Uh, according to the Hoff equation, osmotic pressure is directly proportional to the concentration of solute and the temperature and the equation what is given is uh, RT C1 minus CO which is actually C1 minus CO is the concentration differences between the uh, solute which is inside and outside. Where R is the gas constant, T is the temperature and C1 minus C0 is the difference between the total solute concentration inside and outside of the soles which is in the uh, unit of moles per liter. Now, uh, every mammalian cell is different. So, every mammalian cell is susceptible for the osmotic shock differentially. For example, the cells which are containing the organelles or which are containing the high energy, they may sustain for a longer period of time to the osmotic shock. Whereas, the cells which are of the lower energy and does not contain the organelles, they will be uh, going to be more susceptible for the osmotic shock. One of the example I have shown here is that suppose you take the red blood cells. So, red blood cells are the cells which carry the oxygen inside the body and these are the uh, very essential cells which uh, carry the oxygen from one part of the body to another part and uh, in return it uh, carry the carbon dioxide from the tissue and releases outside. So, if you take the red blood cells and just add a very small amount of maybe one drop of water and that one drop of water is good enough to give such a large osmotic shock that it will it will going to lyse all the cells. What you can see here that we have done a simple experiment in our lab that if you take the cells and put it into the PBS the cells will remain intact. VBS means phosphate buffer saline. So, that will be the isotonic solution and the cell will remain maintained. But if you put the same cells under the hypotonic solution such as the water, the cells are going to lyse and it will give you the bright red color or the slightly brownish color. Now, let us go to the next method. The next method is called as the sonication. The sonication is being done with a specialized instrument called as the sonicator. So, what you see is in a sonicator is the two component. One, the sonic waves generator which is actually uh, outside of the, this box and inside this box what you see is the probe. So, you can have the probe which can actually go into the appendix or you can have the probe which can go into the falcon tubes. You can have the sonicators which are of the bath sonicators where the sonic waves are being generated inside the water and you can have the probe like sonicator which actually in which the sonic waves will be generated through this probe and that actually is going to allow the sonic waves to transmit into the liquid which you will put inside this uh, chamber. This chamber has a lid from outside so that you can close because the sonic waves are not good for the human being. That is why it is always advisable that you should wear the or you should put the cotton plugs before you uh, do the sonications. So, the sonicator is generating the ultrasound waves of frequency more than 20 kilohertz to cause the cell disruption by a process known as the cavitation. In the, the interaction of the sonic waves or uh, interaction of this ultrasound with the liquid causes compression and decompression very rapidly which means when these uh, ultrasound waves are interacting with the liquids, it is actually transmitting the energy from the different layer of the liquid differentially. As a result, what will happen is it is actually compressing because if you put the uh, pressure, if you put the energy into the liquid, the inner the liquid is going to compress. Okay, but once the liquid is going to compress, the other part of the liquid is going to decompress because it has to release 
that amount of uh, the, the pressure okay and as a result of this compression and decompression the, the 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 these waves actually generates the large quantity of bubbles into the liquid and because of that the bubbles are formed in liquid and compresses several thousand atmosphere and gives the shock waves to the cell wall or the plasma membrane to cause the cell lysis. So, because there is a huge pressure difference, a huge compression and decompression, it actually produces the bubble and as, a, as well as because the change in pressure is very high, it actually generates or it actually allow it, it gives the shock waves to the cell wall or to the plasma membrane and as a result the cell is going to be burst and releases the content. So, the sonic uh, waves are uh, uh, also producing very high quantity because there is a rapid change in temperature because once you are doing the compression and decompression, you are also ch changing the uh, pressure inside the liquid and as a result the, you are actually causing the liquid layers causing the friction to each other and as a result of this friction the uh, the, the, the temperature of the liquid is also changing. So, as a result the temperature of this particular whole vessel which you are going to put for sonication has to be maintained and that is why all these vessels are being kept in a in a ice bucket or some kind of ice bath. So, that uh, while you are doing the sonication the temperature of the liquid should not change because that eventually is going to uh, hamper or going to affect the quality of the product which you are going to get. For, for example, if you do not, if you allow the temperature to change, the temperature will go beyond a permissible limit and that actually is going to eventually damage the product what you have, what you are going to produce, especially if the product is thermolabile. Uh, so, the generation of the uh, waves in the liquid causes rapid change in temperature and may cause the thermal denaturation. Hence, the ultrasonication medium need to be cool and a long duration should be avoided. So, that is why the doing a sonication of the bacterial cell or if you do it in Appendorf or to the falcon has to be done in a very, very sophisticated manner and that is why it requires uh, the uh, some kind of uh, the training because what you are supposed to do is you also have to protect yourself from the sonic waves which you are going to produce inside this chamber and at the same time you also have to ensure that you are getting the sonication done without affecting the product. So, we have prepared a small clip of movie to show you how to do a sonication and what are the precautions you should take. So, this is this movie is being prepared in our laboratory and uh, I hope this movie will give you a better chance of learning how to do the uh, sonication to, uh, to disrupt the cells and recover your product. In this video, we will demonstrate how to sonicate the bacterial uh, pellet, how to lyse the cells, bacterial cells. So, we can lyse uh, bacterial uh, cells in multiple ways like sonication one of the method. Apart from that homogenizer we can use. Uh, in this video we will show you how to use a sonicator and lyse the cells. So, after centrifugation we will get the pellet. Okay. So, for this pellet we have to add uh, lysis buffer of your choice. If you are lysing uh, uh, GST, uh, GST containing protein, so for that you need special buffers or if you are using manus, con manus binding protein containing uh, protein, for that you need special buffer. So, it depends on uh, which uh, insert you have and conjugated to uh, what protein. So, here this is a histamine protein. Uh, in uh, further videos, we will show uh, how to purify this protein uh, using nickel NTA column. So, for now, after pelleting down, uh, we have to add lysis buffer to cells and uh, 
suspend and we have to resuspend the pellet in lysis buffer so while doing this make sure that uh, there is no clumps in uh, cell pellet and uh, always keep on ice so why we are keeping on ice here we have to remember most of the proteins heat sensitive so to prevent degradation or uh, dysfunctioning of the proteins we will use ice as a medium like uh, if you keep on ice at least they will be stable and also during sonication we should note that high amount of energy generated so to dissipate that heat we will use ice so uh, I will show you how to operate the uh, sonicator instrument uh, this is the sonicator so where we can adjust the uh, height of the uh, sonicating sample. So this is constantly uh, the sample you want to sonicate. You can adjust the height by changing the mix count. So actually. Um, this is the probe, uh, we are using probe sonicator, uh, normally for uh, larger amount of samples we use this one, uh, we have small one also, if you are using a pen drop, for that you can use small one. While sonication is going on, you have to properly uh, close the door. If you are standing there, you have to use headphones. So, uh, whatever the sonic waves are coming, it will not affect the ears. Sonic waves are very powerful and uh, the most affected organism in our body is ears. So, it may affect internal organs. So it is better to keep it while uh, sonication is going there. So after adjusting, you make sure that the probe is not touching the bottom of this one, but it is just above the bottom. So we can check like this. After that, you have to close, close it properly. These are high energy sound waves are produced during this process. So it is better to close uh, this uh, door. So here, this is where we can adjust the uh, time. So I am going to adjust one hour and uh, pulse I will give 5 seconds Sorry. Uh, 5 seconds on and 25 seconds half cycle so if you give the sonicator probe the probe sonicator is very big if we give more time on pulse then it will give high, it will release a high amount of energy which will, which will ultimately destroy the protein. So it is better to give low on pulse cycle and high uh, 
uh, of pulse IT. So that means they take care of the proper license. So once this process is over, we can uh, check the whether the license is taken place or not. So we just press start here. You can you can hear the sound whether the communication is happening or not. So after one hour, we will come back and check the license. Now let's go to the next method. So next method is called chemical and enzymatic method. So chemical and enzymatic method is in, in those methods you use the chemicals or the enzymes for the cell disruptions. So let's start with the chemical method. In a chemical method, the first method is called as the uh, alkali treatment. So alkali treatment, this is a harsh but effective chemical treatment to lyse the cells. Uh, alkali treatment causes lipid saponifications which disturb the lipid packing and affect the cell wall integrity. Now the next method is the detergent. So detergent is a very very popular method of the uh, cell disruption. In detergent method you have the two possibilities. One is called as the, uh, the lysis, the other method is called as the permeabilization. Addition of a, of a detergent solution to the cell causes solubilization of liquid uh, lipids to form the micelle. The effect of detergent on cell wall increases linearly with the concentration. The detergent concentration which causes abrupt change in lipid solubility and may form micelle in known as the critical, critical micelle concentration or CMC. Examples of different lipids or detergent which people are using very often for cell disruption methods are SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate, CTAB, Triton X100, saponin and gigitonin. So what happen is that when you do a detergent treatment, detergent is nothing but the hydrophobic uh, liquid. So it, co it could be positively charged, it could be negatively charged or it could be neutral in nature. But whatever, it has a hydrophobic core and it has a polar chain. So in, th in that case what happen is the hydrophobic core goes and bind to the hydrophobic lipids and as a result it dissolves the liquid uh, lipids into the detergent. So once the lipid is det uh, dissolved into the detergent, it the, that particular part of the plasma membrane is going to be not present or it is going to be washed away. Okay? And as a result, that particular cell is not going to be intact and as a result, it is going to lyse the cells. But in that case, you can have the option of either to cause the lysis or to cause the permeabilization. What is mean by permeabilization? A partial cell wall disruption or the permeabilization is achieved by the organic solvents such as the toluin. The organic solvents is absorbed by the cell wall resulting its in swelling and ultimate rupture. But at low concentration, organic solvents permeabilizes the cell wall without disturbing the cellular integrity. This process allows to use the cell as a reaction vessel to catalyze the reaction and to get the desired product, which means if you have the cell which actually contains the lipids by layer, if you add the detergent, you are actually going to remove these lipid molecules because they are going to be dissolved into the detergent and as a result, the cell is not going to contain as any plasma membrane and as a result, the cell, this cell is going to uh, release the content into the liquid. Whereas in the other method, either you use the uh, organic solvents or even if you use the detergent, what will happen is if you use the detergent in a very, very controlled concentration, it is not going to remove all the lipids which are present onto the plasma membrane. Instead, it is going to release the lipids in a discrete manner and as a result, it is going to make the holes onto the cell. So that hole does not allow the content to be released. Because if you, if you change the concentration or if you change the exposure period, you could be able to very completely, if you could be able to control the uh, pore size in such a way that uh, the, uh, the content may not be released from the cell. And as a result, you are going to make the holes and this process is known as the 
permalization and that permalization event actually gives you a cell which may loses its content, which may loses its water and all other kind of liquid content, but it may not loses its organelles and other kind of content and so it becomes a empty vessel and in that empty vessel what you can do is you can add the reactants and you can get the product. So, you can actually use these cells as a cellular factory which means if you immobilize these cells to a bioreactor or some kind of surfaces and then you use the very small quantity of uh, detergent or the organic solvent and you achieve a permalization event in such a way that the uh, it loses its cellular content, but it does not lose its organelles and other kind of uh, enzymes. Then in those cases, you can use these cells to catalyze a biotransformations or other kind of uh, chemical reactions like if you change one product to another product or a toxic product to a non-toxic product those kind of events can be done and these uh, permalization can be exploited in that way for the uh, study purpose as well as for utilizing these cells in a industrial uh, application as well. Uh, apart from that we have the enzymatic digestion. So, uh, one of the classical enzymes which we have already been discussing is the lysozyme. So, enzymatic methods are very specific, they are gentle, most effective because the enzymes are very specific for a particular type of biomolecules. So, they will be very, very specific, gentle and effective, but the enzymatic methods are very costly because all these enzymes you have to procure from the uh, uh, in a very, very purified form and all these enzymes are commercially available. So, they will be uh, very costly. So, one of the classical enzyme which we people use is the lysozyme. So, lysozyme is commercially available to treat bacteria to release the signal component. In addition to lysozyme, th uh, there are other kinds of uh, uh, bacteriolytic enzymes which can, you can use. We can use the glycosidases, you can use the uh, the other enzyme and as well as the endopeptidases. Some of the proteases are also been found to be a bacteriolytic enzymes. For example, the if for the yeast cell slices require a mixture of different enzymes such as the gluconases, proteases, manases or chitinases. Plant cell can also be lysed by the celluloses and pectinases because the lysis requires you to degrade different barriers. For example, in the case of the plant cells, the plant cell has a cell wall. The cell wall is made up of, of cellulose. So, within the plant cells you have the lignin which is actually the uh, 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 material which is present within the matrix of the, with the two plant cells and which is actually making the uh, two plant cells uh, making the uh, joining the two, two plant cells. So, this lignin also has to be degraded that is why if you want to disrupt the plant cells you have to first disrupt the cell wall. So, you have to use the cellulase enzyme and then since you want to degrade these uh, matrix protein also then you have to use the pectinase to degrade the pectin or you have to use the ligninase to degrade the lignin and then only the plant cells will be uh, free to uh, present and then you can give the osmotic shock or eventually the plant cell will experience the osmotic shock if your outer uh, outer uh, environment is the hypotonic in nature and then eventually it is going to lyse the cells. In most of the enzymatic mediated cell lysis method, the rupture of the cell wall depends on the osmotic pressure of the external media. As I said, you know, once you remove the cellular barriers, then you just need to give the osmotic shock and that will depend on the what you have in the outer media. In few cases, the enzymatic digestion is performed to remove the external cell wall and then in second step, the protoplast what is which is being generated when you remove the cell wall is being disrupted by the gentle agitations. Now, let us move on to the third method. The third method is called as the mechanical method. The mechanical method it is in the in the simplest mechanical method the cell disruption method used in the laboratory is called as the wiring bullender as well as the pestle mortar. 
you might have seen warring blender the warring blender is nothing but a, a simple uh, mixer what people use in uh, in our home you might have seen that these mixes people in in your mother or your grandmother is always using to prepare the chutney so what you do is you just take the small pieces of coriander and you put the onion garlic and all other thing and then you run the coriander's uh, then you run the uh, these uh, mixy the mixy is nothing but containing a bowl and then it contains the blades these blades are actually cutting the cells and actually grinding them and in grinding them in such a high speed that it eventually cutting all the cells and giving you a uh, a, a, a soup actually and that soup is nothing but the cellular content so the warring blender is nothing but the uh, mixy whereas the pestle mortar is the simplest form of the homogenizer you might see a pestle mortar a typical pestle mortar is look like a bowl which is could be made up of of glass or could be made up of of ceramics and then you have the pestle so what you have to do is you have to put your uh, content which you want to homogenize into this bowl and then you use this uh, pestle and uh, the grind them so in this grinding process what happen is the material is been crushed between the two layer of pestle and mortar and as a result when you grind them it actually crush the cells and as a result the content comes out and it becomes a simple paste both are effective towards animal and plant cells as well as the filamentous bacteria whereas in the industrial setup the cell disruption is carried out by bead mill or the high pressure homogenizers so the bead mill disruptor so a typical bead mill disruptor is shown here it could be a horizontal bead mill disruptor or the vertical bead disruptor so what you have in this uh, disruptor you have a central shaft which is a central shaft fitted with a uh, with with a number of impellers so these are the impellers so uh, uh, which can move in either clockwise or the anti clockwise with the help of a motor so these you have a central shaft and then you have the impellers which are attached to this and then you can connect this uh, shaft to a motor this motor will uh, allow this to go into the uh, clockwise or to the anti clockwise uh, then what you do is you take this, this you fill this chamber with the the grinding cylinder is filled with the beads which are made up of of glass alumina titanium carbide uh, zirconium oxide or zirconium sulfate so then you fill this whole chamber with the beads which could be either glass alumina titanium carbide zirconium oxide or the zirconium sulfate so depending on the type of material what you would like to homogenize you can use or you can choose the beads of that particular type suppose you want to use the gentle cells then you can use the glass beads but if you are having the plant or some very ha ha hard material then you can use the titanium beads or the zirconium beads then what you do is from the inlet you put your cell suspension and then you let these uh, impellers to move while the when the impellers will move uh, they will also going to move the beads along with that so what will happen is the beads are actually going to move and they will going to run over the cells so when they they will run over the cells or the cell will pass through to these beads because the area is very very narrow the beads are going to crush these cells and as a result the the cell is going to experience very high level of shear stress because when the cell is passing through this narrow pass it is going to experience the shear stress and as a result of shear stress the cell will try to expand and the expansion would be uneven or sometimes the expansion would be so much that it is going to lyse the cells so there is a inlet to supply the cells suspension and a outlet to collect the sample after the process when the bead mill runs cell experience a shear forces between the produce 
and moving beads and the cells. So, what will happen is the rate, the rate and the degree of disruption between depends on the cell type, the thickness of cell wall, localization of the product, type and adjacent speeds of impeller, bead size, its density, loading, resistance time and temperature. Cell disruption in a bead mill and release of product is a first order kinetics and it may be given by the equation lin uh, c, c max by c max minus c is equal to minus kt where c max is the concentration of the product that can be released from a given amount of cell suspension. C is the concentration of the product release at given time t and k is the first order constant. This relationship holds only for the batch mode of operation which means it is not the continuous mode of operation. Once you fill the uh, chamber then you keep running and that actually will maintain this particular type of relationship. The value of k will depends on the type of impeller, the size of the impeller and the loading, the speed of agitation and the temperature. And depending on the, uh, the k you will get the better grinding, better homogenizations. Now let us go to the high pressure homogenizers. The high pressure homogenizers uh, consist of a high pressure positive displacement pump connected to the adjacent discharge wall with a restricted opening. So this is the restricted opening which is present between the wall and the pump. The cell suspension is sending into the homogenizer through a small homogenizing valve at a very high pressure which is approximately 200 to 1000 atmospheric pressure. So what happen is when you are feeding the cell into this high pressure homogenizer, the cell are passing through this narrow uh, uh, space and they will do the exactly the same when they will passing through this narrow space they are actually experiencing the shear stress and uh, because they are passing through a very very high pressure which is up to 200 to 1000 atmospheric pressure, the cells are experiencing very high level of shear stress and as a result the cell are going to be broken down exactly with the same mechanism that when you put a shear stress the cell will try to expand to reduce the stress level and in that process the cell is going to be disrupted. Uh, the, the shear stress is developed uh, as a dynamic pressure PS and it is expressed as PS is equal to half PV square where PS is the dynamic pressure, V is the jet velocity and the rho is the density of the fluid which you are using for homogenization. The cell disruption is in a high pressure homogenization and a release of a product is also uh, following the first order kinetics with uh, equation known as C max divided by C max minus C is equal to K n where n is the number of passes through the wall which means how many times you will pass through to this uh, cell suspension to this narrow pass. And the K is the first order K constant as high pressure homogenization passes the cell at a very high speed through a narrow wall, it disrupt the cells and the simultaneously it lower down the pressure as well. So that is the advantage. In most of the cases we have seen the cell disruption, we have seen that when the while the process is going on, it actually not uh, giving the uh, shear stress but at the same time it is increasing the. Uh, temperature of the media because there is a friction forces also. Whereas in these cases while it is giving the high pressure or passing the liquids through a high pressure, it is also making the system cool because uh, it is lowering down the temperature as well. So with this uh, we, have, uh, we have discussed about the different cell disruption method which are available and which can be used as per the, uh, the uh, host as well as the physical as well as the chemical properties of the host and 
there is there are this there are different advantages as well as the disadvantages of all these methods so depending on the requirement as well as the infrastructure you can choose either of these methods and uh, you can use them into your laboratory to extract or release the content from the cells which are having the overexpressed uh, proteins or overexpressed material so with this we would like to conclude our lecture here in our next lecture we are going to discuss about how to purify this product which you have uh, uh, taken out from the cells thank you